There's something magical when a film goes through a projector, the beam of light. <laughs> That's the cycle we based on. This is a shot from Hitchcock. The camera always sees the truth. Fantastic. We're going to watch films from right here to the air. The French actress Jeanne Moreau is so good you want to freeze frame her. Her face is one of the most expressive in the movies. Orson Welles called her the greatest actress in the world. Jean Cocteau said that she's a wire of steel. All oh, my characters are anarchists, says Moreau. In well over a hundred movies, she's proved herself to be the freest soul in cinema since silent movie star Louise Brooks. That's what cinema is about, the soul. Moreau knew Picasso, Jean Renoir, Marguerite Duras, and Jean Genet, was briefly married to the director of The Exorcist, William Friedkin, and is one of the few women to be invited into the Académie des Beaux-Arts. In every way, she's ambiguous, feminine and masculine, enchanting and tough, modern and not, half English on her mother's side. These are beautiful. Look at the color of them. She was brainy from the start, read the classics in childhood, got rave reviews in the Comédie Française in the 40s, and was in more than 20 films in the 50s. Then, at the end of that decade, she became the bracing muse of directors Louis Malle, François Truffaut, Antonioni, Bunuel, Orson Welles, and Joseph Lucy. She was a liberated figure in their work. This is an understated little room. She transformed herself in the 70s and since, but it's her milestone films of the 60s which we focus on today. I have to smoke a cigarette. You smoke it. You can smoke on camera if you want. No. No. She says that acting is mysterious and irrational, so it's hard to pin down. We talk in the Hotel Maurice where she spent time with one of the giants of cinema, Orson Welles. I was living in a hotel on the Tuileries, pacing up and down in my bedroom, looking out the window. Orson used to have a suite overlooking the Tuileries and going towards um, Orsay. One evening before starting uh, Le Procès, the Kafka film. The trial in the English. The trial. Yeah. He asked me if I wanted a sherry. I said, no, I never had any sherry in my life. He said, well, that's very good, and especially when it's ice cold, okay. Now, there were no sets in Paris. There were no studios available to build sets. It was Saturday. On Monday, we were to be shooting in Zagreb. We had to cancel everything, apparently to close the picture. So finally, he said, look, isn't that strange? And I saw the moon, very large, what we in America call a harvest moon, enormous. He said, there are two moons two moons you know like two suns or something sort of sign from heaven so that forced me to get up and i thought god he's even drunker than i am and we looked and these were the two clocks and on each moon there were numbers and i realized they were the clock faces of the god d'orsay when i said maybe that's the ideal place for you to shoot the trial because it's empty and at 5.30 in the morning, I went downstairs, got in a cab, crossed the Seine, and entered this empty railway station. So it was your idea? Yeah. Where I discovered the world of Kafka. And uh, you, Jan, went on to play a part in the trial? The yes. And uh, you're a prostitute who rents the room next door to Anthony Perkins' character, Joseph Kay, yeah. who's accused of an abstract crime. He must have done something. Oh, don't say that. Don't you say that. Oh, somebody's been telling lies about it. Could be it. Rumors. They're always flying around for no reason. Rumors? Yeah, well, well at the office. What kind of rumors? You mean in my case? That's just it. I haven't the faintest idea. Jesus! 
I hope it isn't political. Oh, no, no, nothing like that. Politics, don't go dragging me into it. Oh, Miss Burson, I'm afraid we're just talking in circles. That's not my fault. I'm not talking in circles. I don't even want to talk. What are you doing in here, anyway? Well, you invited me. Miss Get, get out! Get out of here! Miss Burstner, please! Get out and stay out and leave me alone! Miss Burstner, please, what will the other lodgers think? And Mrs. Grub Grubach, you'll wake up. Get the hell out of my room! Oh, I'm out! Filming with Orson, it was such an experience, was such a miracle that uh, one could only wish it would last forever. Why a miracle? Full of surprises, improvisation, and suddenly he's gone, nobody's there, and then he reappears, he changes the lights, uh, he has given orders. Orson said that cinema is great, but not as great as painting or ballet. He's right. Or as big as uh, music. Why? That's disappointing. I, would, I thought you would have stood up for cinema. I, I love cinema. It, I, to me, it's um, a main art of, the, of this century. But you don't carry it inside yourself. Music is different. Music is the language of the gods. But I think people would carry around, for example, the memories of seeing the first fresh French films of the late 50s, 60s, the first time that they saw a freeze frame when you go like the you sad yeah. and when you go happy. Well, as you, as you I understand what you mean, but you see, if you carry with you very, very good, good films, you carry with you the images that are thought, that, are, that were decided, that were chosen by somebody you respect and admire. You know that there is a moral attitude towards images. Godard said that it's a moral attitude to place the camera in the right side. Some people are shockingly filming people. It's, an, it's aggressive, it's obscene. So you watch the images chosen by somebody. But with music, whatever, Bob Dylan, Wagner, Bach, it takes you where you want it. You seem to be saying that music is more imaginatively open, that it allows yes, your mind exactly. to move the way and it lives And to put an end to our discussions, yes. if I said I prefer books. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. I Good, love I'm glad, because then we'd be talking for another hour about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so back to Wells. I've got some scenes here from Chimes at Midnight, perhaps his greatest film, uh, where you again play a prostitute and friend of Sir John Falstaff, yeah. who I think Wells described as the best good man in all of literature. Fat muddy rascal. You make fat rascals, though. I make them. Gluttony and diseases make them. If the cook helped to make the gluttony, you helped to make the diseases. We catch you. Hmm? Ooh, we catch of you. But to serve bravely is to come halting off. You know, to come off the breach with his pike bed bravely. And to surgery bravely. To venture upon the charge chambers bravely. You muddy conger. Orson used to hide his makeup so he wouldn't shoot. Tell me, tell me about that. Well, he said, um, I've lost my makeup. I've lost my nose. I've lost everything. I can't find that bloody makeup. And he said, uh, I'd be ready in about an hour if I find my makeup. So we waited an hour, an hour and a half, and then I said, I'll, uh, I'll go to his uh, little room. And I was carrying my cigarette and uh, lighter, and it fell under the couch. So I knelt down to catch it, and there I discovered the little makeup kit. He had hidden it? He had hidden it under the couch. It had been there all the time. Why? I don't know. But you must guess. No, I don't believe in psychologic explanation. I like mysteries to be mysteries. But it's a mystery. Orson Welles, a very good actor, was refusing to do his scenes. You must have some thoughts on why. No. You must. You're an actor also. Have you ever done anything like that? No. It's very personal. I wouldn't say anything about it. He's a genius. He's a very strange person. You've often said that you thought he was delicate in some way. Yes, and self-destructive. Yeah. Do you think he was always delicate and self-destructive, or do you think what happened to him well, in the early could, part of his career? He could be very brutal, but I've never seen him like that. Are you not hurt at the groin? I mean, that body, that voice, that laughter is incredible. 
rascal slave. Oh, you sweet little rogue. The rascal braggings. You wholesome little valiant villain, you. Poor ape, how are you sweating? The rogue fled from me like quicksilver. Come, let me wipe thy face. Come on, you horse and chops. Oh, roguey faith, I love thee. I'll toss the rogue in a blanket. Do and thou darest for thy heart. And thou dost, I'll canvas thee between a pair of sheets. What I discovered with the years, it's that all the people who had worked with Orson loved him and were faithful. And it was the same for me. Don't forget me when I'm gone. You stop me weeping if you say so. Kiss me, darling. Is it not strange that desire should so many years outlive performance? I love thee better than I love our scurvy young boy of them all. Do you believe that there's such a thing as genius? And if so, was he a genius? Of course I believe in genius. What is it then? I don't know. It's mysterious. It's very uncomfortable. It's better to have talent and be a hard worker than to be a genius. Because you're full of so many things. He could do anything. How talented are you? Are you a genius? No, I'm not a genius. How talented are you? I'm just, uh, I don't know, let's not speak about me. Why? What's wrong with that? Because I'm talking about Orson. I've seen him, I've seen him desperate, I've seen him ill-treated. He was just like a baby. For the people who have power, who have money, he was dangerous. Because he could take them, you know, he was such a magician. Could I just stick in this point about how talented you are? I don't know if I'm talented because I'm not making a career. I've, I've been given a life. I try to make myself a real good life. Let's say that uh, when I was born as a gift, I received a piece of land. Mm -hmm. huh? And a part of it was exposed to the sun. The other one was not. There was too much humidity. Here there were stones. Here I couldn't grow roses. And Let's say that this piece of land is given to me, has been given to me, and the life that is given to me, it's for me to look after that piece of land. And when I leave, let's hope it looks like a good garden, a nice garden. Hmm. Okay, so you came across another one of the greats of the cinema, someone who came from a, a much earlier period than Orson Welles, the silent period. Do you know who I'm talking about? Can you guess? You're about to see. Ah, Lillian Gish. I wanted to meet her because in 1970 I had planned to make a documentary, you know, a series of portraits of American stars, and whom else could I start with but Lillian Gish? If you had a child and just one gift to give it, what would it be? Oh, curiosity. Now, isn't she adorable? If you have curiosity, yeah. You're never bored. She's adorable. Uh, it's a great answer, that, isn't it? Of course. Did that surprise you that she says the most important thing? No, I knew she would. Because what? that's the zest of life. So many people are bored and not curious. You know, it starts around 35 years old. They're just like half dead. They have the impression they know everything. They're jaded you know, blasé, and uh, no curiosity, you know? The, the uh, American filmmaker David Lynch says that as you get older, your window closes, so you let less and less in, so you're less and less in contact with the world. Well, I'm the opposite. And yet, I think the reason why his films are so good is that he won't yes. take any consideration of the rest of the world. It's just a projection yeah, of Yeah, well, because he has an inner life. I mean, I'm talking about regular people. A man like David Lynch, his obsession draws him deep, deep, deep inside. But the more time passes by, the more I open up to everything. And sometimes it's exhausting. Could you give me an example of what you mean? Well, for example, I'm go uh, Fanny Ardant wants me to direct her on stage in a Phaedra. And I don't want to do the Phaedra of Racine, but Senec. So since about three months now, 
I'm dwelling in the world of ancient Greece and my daily companions are the gods. You mentioned Racine there, and you were reading Racine before the age of 13 and things like that, is that yes, true? Yes, because I wanted to be one of the, the heroines of Racine or Berenice or Phaedra, so I learned, oui, prince, je languis, je brûle pour t'aiser, je l'aime non point tel que l'on vu les enfers. You know, I was learning that, and I was, uh, to me, it was passion and jealousy and death, and I adore that. It sounds to me as if you were reading people like that when other people of your generation were reading the more fashionable books by the early existentialists and things. I didn't give a damn. And, and especially one phrase of Sartre, l'enfer c'est les autres, hell is the others. And I was so sure that hell was ourselves. Why? Because the most difficult thing you have to go through, they come from inside you. The demons I carry inside of myself, not the point of view of the others. Whatever they think of me, what, that's not the essential. It's that inner voice I have inside. Well, I have to ask, what are the demons? Well, I couldn't answer precisely, because they wouldn't allow me to say. Demons are always self-destructive, unless you tame them and you use them, and they come out in what you do in front of a camera. How many times in your life have you been really, really unhappy? Many, many times. Not unhappy, desperate. Uh -huh. I've never been unhappy. Uh -huh. Because to be desperate, it's a violent state. I've always been in violent states. Suicidal desperate? No. I never thought about killing myself. Killing somebody, yes, but not killing myself. <laughs> <laughs> no. We, we, we were touching there on what you were like as someone at age 10 and everything like that, and you were in Paris for part of the time of the occupation. Yeah. I've got some images here of the occupation at Paris. There's no sound in this material. And by chance, there are images of the swastika hanging outside this very building. Um, how did it affect you? seeing this kind of thing. Profoundly. There's a great shot coming up here. Of, look, look at these women, look at their faces. Oh, that's terrible. That could have been your mother, couldn't it, at the same age? Maybe a little younger. No, my mother was very young at that time. We wanted to walk and cross the river Loire. But the second day we were on the roads, the uh, planes came over and the machine gun, you know, they were machine gunning uh, each side of the road. Some people who were with us pushed us into the, the side, you know, where the, uh, we call it in French, fossé. Mm, the ditch. The, the ditch. And people f falling on my back and there was my mother and my sister and I was grabbing my mother's feet and screams, and then suddenly something dripping. And when it was over, it were, there were dead bodies on us. They had protected us, and it was blood. Well, to make a long story short, we went back to Paris in one of those trains, the same trains that took the Jewish people into the camps. But very funnily, this period with, with no men but the army of occupation, we had a sense of freedom, all the girls, because there were no fathers, no, you know, only the women were working, trying to bring money and do things. But that didn't last long, of course, when the first girls, some of them didn't come back to school and s some others came and they had the, the yellow star. Yeah, it was an incredible period. Some people got very political after the war, but you were no, never a political I'm not, animal. I never. I know how absurd it is. What, politics? Yes. And your mother, she was a dancer, and, and when she had you, did that bring her dancing career to an end? Of course it did. And she resented that? 
No, I'm sure she did. Did she ever talk to you about that? No. But the fact that uh, my father not wanting me to be an actress, the way she stood by my side, the way she helped me lead a double life, because my father never knew. The only, the, 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 he discovered I was an actress when he saw my f picture in front page of a newspaper. I've got publicity still of what you looked like in those days, and um, it's a very sort of typical canon of beauty, isn't it? Well, m my breasts are false. <laughs> Because it was the fashion at that time. And Janet I, Lee, comic book and, and I had none, you know? And you see, they asked me to put my arms like that just to Keep show. Sure. And you were considered unphotogenic? Yeah. I didn't look like the regular stars at that time. Uh -huh. Did that bother you? No. Mm -hmm. And the makeup too much? I thought to myself, me. fuck them. I don't give a damn. I mean, Where did that confidence come from? My demons. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to hear a lot about these things. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, that confidence came from... I mean, how can you do such a crazy thing and live all your life as an actress or a director, whatever, unless there is something very special on your mind? I don't mean that we are better or less than anybody, but we are different. And I never forget, I had to go down the Champs-Élysées and there was a big cinema, now it has disappeared, where there was the billboard of Les Amants, of Louis Malle. When I passed with my car, I used to hide myself. I thought, God, it's a huge success. It's a hit all over the world. And then, what's next? What's going to happen next? For people who weren't there, it's still very hard to imagine the difference between the films of the 50s when you looked like that with the false breasts and everything? Not false breasts, I mean, I had a little, maybe uh, I had cotton wool in my bra, that's all. Uh, and the loads of makeup and everything like that. What changed between that and the two films you made with, with Mal that made you an international star? Well, you don't have those when in close ups, these lighting cameramen would say, so your shadow wouldn't show the shadow under your eyes. And then this part is too big. So you had to be very emotional. And you couldn't move. You were trapped. You know, you were in close-up. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and then, I mean, I mean, you know very well what the new wave uh, was. The new film directors who made films in another way. Okay. With, uh, with Louis and with the other directors, the camera became light. We were in the streets. There was very little money. I would do my makeup, choose my costumes. So there's a freedom. I discovered freedom, total. We would shoot. Then suddenly, Francois Truffaut, that happened in Jules and Jim, he said, I have to think about it. We're not shooting tomorrow. OK, we didn't shoot. And then the day after, we would shoot twice as much, improvise or learn our lines just like that. That's the way it should be. Of course, it was a total other world. I've got to hear the most famous bit of the second film that you made with Louis Mal, Les Amants, the lover, the bit that shocked people. And I'm sure made more difficult because you were then in a relationship with the director. Looking back, obviously, a, mi a milestone in, in that oral sex hadn't been portrayed that way in mainstream cinema before. It's not only sex, it's how sex can transform somebody. Mon amour. I understand why it's shocking. It's more shocking than to see a uh, penetration or whatever. That's only physical. Here, it's not only physical. Oh, my man. And the story itself was quite shocking for its time. She's been married eight years. She lives in a posh family. She's got a child. Yes. And she meets this, he's an archaeologist, mm. and gives her a lift, and she goes off with him. L'amour peut naître d'un regard. Jeanne, en un instant, 
senti mourir sa gêne et sa pudeur. You must have thought this would be scandalous. No, I, I didn't think about that. When I do things, I don't think about the effect yeah. what I, of what I'm doing is going to have. Yeah. It was an act of love. I loved Louis. I was in love with him passionately. I'm still in love with him. And he asked me to do it, and that was my gift to him. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, as you've said before, though, doing this sex scene was a poisoned gift because it destroyed your intimacy with Louis. Yes, it was a poison gift, I knew, because um, after that we didn't live together anymore. But I don't regret it. Our relationship was marvelous, and uh, even when the life together was over, it doesn't matter. I know that nothing lasts. And um, so many of your films are about the end of love. There's, there's even in this film, there's a hint that maybe the, yeah. this new relationship will not last. Exactly. And so, do With you the white horse. Yeah, yeah. The white horse is there because of me. Uh -huh. I asked for the white horse. I said to Louis, do you know that as a child, I was taught by my grandfather in England, when you see a white horse, you say, white horse, white horse, give me good luck, good luck to me, good luck to you, and good luck to every white horse like you. And you spit, and you should never look at the horse again. So I said, I want a white horse for the last shot. Good luck for the film. Yeah, and I can't think of a film of yours which the love relationships last. Well, I don't see any films. Any film. But of yours? No, but of others. Yeah. Um, well, they love. Uh, do, you, do you ever wish that you had had a single man in your life all your life, just one constant lover throughout your whole life? Why should I dream about a thing like that? It w if it was supposed to happen to me, yeah. it would have happened. Yeah. When you split from L Louis Mal, you, you told a story in a documentary once that you were very unhappy, I think, and uh, you wanted to write to Ingmar Bergman. I did write to Ingmar Bergman. Yeah. Isn't that a, a very unusual thing to do, to write to someone whom you'd never met? Did you not have, like, female friends? You could just go and, and say, look, I feel... I would about that to a female friend. Why? I knew that Ingmar Bergman would understand. No, I'm, I didn't expect any answer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Could have been a writer I've never met. Uh -huh. Of course, I knew Virginia Woolf was dead. I wouldn't write to Virginia Woolf in any way, being an English woman. The life she led, I wouldn't write to Virginia Woolf. But having seen films of Ingmar Bergman, I knew that he would understand. Um, you made a another film very similar in theme to this one, again about a woman who's been married about eight years, who wants to escape, she feels trapped by her life, Moderato Cantabile. Oh, that was the Marguerite Duras. Marguerite Duras, one of your best films, I think. I don't know. I've got a scene here from the end, towards the end of the film. I haven't which seen is, it for years. I think I've never, must. <laughs> I've never seen it. I think I've never you seen it. You and Belmondo. Yeah. And he plays your lover, of course. J'ai peur. Look at that. J'ai peur. J'ai peur. Je voudrais que vous soyez mort. Screams like a dog. Hmm. And in Les Amants, she's got the courage to leave the prison of her husband and everything. Here she hasn't. Yes, but I mean, these. I, I did films where she, I was a married woman, but there are other films where I was married at all. Yeah. And you recently played Duras yeah. in a film set at Morla. We're going to have a little look at it here. And you knew Duras? Yeah, I met her in 1953 54. Uh -huh. And we saw one another regularly for about. 18 years, yes. 
and she started writing these novels in the 50s that were quite modernist, quite cinematic. Yes. And then she wrote the script for Hiroshima Mon Amour. Yeah. People in her books, they're stuck. They can't actually change anything. Yeah. All they do is circle in this kind of loop of Well, desire. because she cannot stand the usual regular yeah. love relationship. Yeah. You know. And a perfect example of that is Cet Amour La, which is based on a true story, isn't it? It is what a happened? true story. She had a younger lover. He was 40 years younger than, than herself. And he lived with her until she died. So he spent 24 years dedicated to her. Bon, moi je vais faire du café. Puis après je me mets au travail. Bien sûr, vous savez pas taper à la machine. Si, avec deux doigts. Bon, on va voir. On se connaît depuis quand Depuis hier. Depuis que je vous écris. Depuis que je lis tout ce que vous écrivez. Depuis toujours. Non. It's great. Depuis avant toujours. Non, ça suffit, t'es fou. Vous essayez de me plaire avec des phrases vides. J'en ai connu des mecs, vous savez, qui récitaient du Duras appris par cœur. Croyez-moi, ils sont pas restés longtemps. Pourquoi est-ce que je vous ai dit de venir Pourquoi est-ce que j'ai accepté Je suis complètement fou. Allez, prenez votre bain. Et prenez tout votre temps. You see, what is amazing in that story, it's her life, but it looks like the life of one of her characters. She believed in fate. Maybe without knowing it. This boy looked like a character in her books. He was suicidal. And the fact that he was attracted by what she wrote meant that intimately, very, very deep somewhere, they were related. Mm -hmm. um, you went from making s films about very trapped women to making a film about a woman called Catherine Catherine, mm -hmm. one of the freest women probably in all of the movies, and Jules Léger. <laughs> Yes, she's the freest woman, but at what price? Exactly. Here's her introduction in the film. La troisième, Catherine, la française, avait le sourire de la statue de Lille. Son nez, sa bouche, son menton, son front étaient la fierté d'une province qu'elle avait incarnée enfant lors d'une fête religieuse. Cela commençait comme un rêve. Doesn't come better than that as an introduction, does it? That was a very happy atmosphere on that film. Yeah. Very little money. At one point, we had to stop. There was no money, but luckily, I had made a film. You put your money up yourself. Yeah. And, but I mean, of course she's a free woman. She loves two men, but it doesn't work. And at the end, she's a killer. She kills herself and she kills her lover. And is it right to say that the film clamps down morally? Fr Truffaut said it was a very moral film. It is a very moral film. But I don't, I don't think the second part destroys the first part because even now there are some students, they come up to me and they speak to me about Catherine but they forgot, forgot everything, the, the last image. Yeah. You know, when she says to Jim, to Jules, look, look at us, and in the car now. Jules, regarde-nous bien. And she smiles as she does yeah, it? Yeah, she smiles. People forget that image. Would it have been a better film if she wasn't a murderess? No. The film is the, the way it is. You can't imagine any other way. Truffaut said that there was a risk that she could have been a really boring character. because she's that so because she's a man. Explain that comment. No, but why, why would she be boring? Because she's capricious, because she does the first thing that comes into her mind. And what's and that boring can be, about that? Well, that can be extremely interesting as long as the thing she does is charming. But if it isn't charming, she can just seem like an egotist. And then so what? Some men love egotist women. No, they, they, get tired, they get tired of them. And what about women? Yeah. Are, are they getting tired of egotist men? But we're talking about this film and the but game. But anyway, to make a long story short, she's not boring. 
I agree she's not boring, but I'm trying to put the devil's advocate point to you. <laughs> Dans le couple, l'important, c'est la fidélité de la femme. Celle de l'homme est secondaire. Qui a écrit La femme est naturelle, donc abominable. C'est Baudelaire, mais il parlait des femmes d'un certain monde et d'une certaine société. Mais pas du tout, il parlait de la femme en général. Ce qu'il dit de la jeune fille, c'est magnifique, épouvantail, monstre, assassin des lards, dit ouais. sot, dit salope. La plus grande imbécilité unie avec la plus grande dépravation. Pour un instant, je yes. l'ai <laughs> That's monstrous. I remember that moment so well. Les femmes dans l'église, quelles conversations peuvent-elles avoir avec Dieu Vous êtes deux idiots. Moi, je n'ai rien dit et je n'approuve pas forcément ce que dit Jules à deux heures du matin. Alors, protestez. Je proteste. And you know what? It was not far from a bridge. And there were people looking out. And they said, Allez, vas-y, is she going to jump? And freezing cold. And I had a double. Uh -huh. The double was in, my, uh, in the trailer where there were blankets and things and the different costumes to put on her. But as it took time to film, when it was her turn to jump into the river, she was so drunk, we couldn't bring her out. So I did it. I had to do it. Wow, you're a trooper. And what do you think of the dialogue in that scene? Oh, I love it. But they're saying women, women are empty, women... Yes, but I mean, it's the writing. It's what you read regularly yeah. in, uh, in novels in the 19th century, beginning yeah. of 20th century. Okay, um, I can't resist having a look at this song from this film. Oh, yeah. Elle avait des bagues à chaque doigt, des tas de bracelets autour des poignets, et puis elle chantait avec une voix qui s'y in this film, I did everything. I did the, uh, the sets and everything. I chose the costumes. Because there were so few of you? Yeah. And I used to do the cooking. Je me suis saoulé en l'écoutant, l'alcool fait oublier le temps. Je me suis réveillé en sentant des baisers sur mon front brûlant, des baisers sur mon front brûlant. On s'est connu, on s'est reconnu, on s'est perdu de vue, on s'est perdu de vue, on s'est retrouvé, on s'est séparé, puis on s'est réchauffé. Chacun pour soi et yes, ressorti dans son million de la vie. Je l'ai revu un soir. That's the only day we had the, the sound, because we couldn't afford it. Sound recordist? Yeah. Huh. All the rest of the, we dubbed all the film. We dubbed everything. When the collection of Truffaut's letters came out, his letters to you weren't in it? No. Why? Because they won't be. They're mine. But you owe it to movie history? To I don't owe anything to anybody. These letters are mine. And will you ever publish them? No. That's a shame, isn't it? Because your creative relationship with him is, was one of the most important in his career and in your careers as well. Surely... But they had nothing to do with it. They were private. They're are mine. they just purely personal? There's no discussion of the of No, of the we never discussed films together. Our letters are very personal. Uh-huh. Okay. After this, you made a film that is probably more contested than most of the films. Some critics think it's one of the great Jean Moreau films, the great films of the 60s. Some people think it's awful. Uh, directed by Joseph Losey. Eva? Oh, it's a beautiful film. We've got one of the scenes here where you're dancing around to Billie Holiday. Oh, it's the first time, yes, when she enters that place. So she's in the house of Stanley Baker, yeah. whose lives will soon intertwine. She's a whore. Weep in sympathy. Bend your branches down along the ground and cover me. And, and the Billie Holiday songs, were they your ideas? Or yeah. And, um, why? why? What did you I don't know. It was when, f uh, first time uh, Joe visited me, I was listening to Billie Holiday, only Billie Holiday. 
So he liked it, and uh, that's it. Does she pass the Lillian Gish test, the curiosity test? Is she curious about life, Eva? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think she is. I think that she carries such a, a weight because of her, the past, her past. And I remember the scene where she, she's in front of that incredible, beautiful door in Rome when she speaks to Stanley Baker about her childhood. Yeah, a crucial scene that was unbelievably deleted from the film. We were orphans too, my sister and myself. She took in washing in Lyon until she got sick of tuberculosis. The man who lived above us, he was married with five children. He said he would look after us if I was 11, you understand? And then she laughs and she says, no, it's not true, I've invented it. It is true. <laughs> You'd believe anything. It's a very powerful film. It should, I think it should be re-released. If possible, you know, it's because it's, it's not well enough known. Then we've talked about the Orson Welles period, and this is where you started making Orson Welles films. And in the 60s, you also made a film with, with Burt Lancaster. What was he like to work with? A pain in the neck, really. I mean, I remember the scenes we had in this little house. It took hours and hours and hours, and the crew was waiting outside because he was discussing bit by bit with John Frankenheimer. Of course, John Frankenheimer would never have the guts to say he was a pain in the neck. And shockingly, he asked me once if I had young friends, younger friends than mine. I said, Yes, my age and younger, too. He said, I would be interested in meeting them. What a rude person. What does that mean? Horrible. What does that mean? He well, he wanted to see women younger than myself, some of my friends, actresses or not, and maybe, you know. And was he so fussy about discussing because of method acting training? Yeah, I think it? so. He was a bore. In the 1970s, jumping forward somewhat, America had its own kind of new wave, and we've already talked about Scorsese and these new directors coming along, who sort of 10 years after the Truffauts and the Homers and these people were discovering the secrets that the French had had 10 years earlier. But you, you, you didn't work with any of those people. Instead, you did things like Les Valseuses, incredibly well-known in France, less well-known in the UK. It's known in the States. Yes, and um, amazing film. She comes out of prison. Yeah, she comes out of prison. And um, this is late into the story, which has so far been about two lads on the rampage chasing younger women. And then they decide they want to have sex with a, a woman who, because she hasn't had any sex in prison, she'll be desperate for it. Qu'est-ce qu'elle est tarte? Moi, je la trouve belle. Well, they were, he's dead. Gérard looked very beautiful when he was younger, too. Qu'est-ce que vous voulez? Yes, it's a beautiful sequence. But then this happens, doesn't it? Yeah, she kills herself.
And when, when you read the script, what did you think? I refused the part. I didn't want to do it. That's and it's just because Gérard came to me and he said, I pray you, I need you, please do it for me. I said, okay, I'll do it. That's what decides me to do things sometimes. The script is meaningful to me. Meaningless to me, I mean. What is interesting, it's the director and the way he imagines a woman, the way she's dressed, the way she's made up. Women in men's film are the fantasies of men. And they have to admit that and to accept that. That's the work of an actress. Mm. And did you feel very um, controlled by it? Did you feel like a pawn? No, that I don't mind. Mm. You remember that scene in the film that you directed, Lumière, where you're sitting on the bed on camera as an actress? Tu regardes un peu vers la caméra. Un peu vers moi maintenant. Baisse les yeux un peu. À nouveau, regard vers la caméra. OK, coupé. Bon, attends, And the director is saying, hey, move your head, do this, take well, off Well, you know why? What because that? that's what Orson did. The film that has disappeared, called The Deep. The Deep. He would say things to me, and he would say, you just repeat. So I would repeat. And he said, turn your head on the right. So I did, and on the left. And close your eyes. And now look at me, and now cry. So I did everything he did. But you're Jeanne Moreau, you're not some starlet. Why would it be satisfying well, for I, you I'm, to do I'm, that? Well, I mean, I love that. Why? It was an incredible communication with Orson. But you're just a puppet? But no, I was not a puppet. I was feeding him as much as he, he, did, he did feed me, as much did I feed him. I know that I was provocative. He was provocative, but it was an exchange. It was like love making. We were the two of us, alone in the whole world. He knew he could dwell inside of me, inside the most intimate emotions. He didn't ask out of the blue, now please cry. He knew I could. I wouldn't do that with a nobody. <laughs> because, not because I would, wouldn't want to. But that person, he was playing, I was a, his instrument. That's the way Hitchcock directed actresses, isn't it? Very, very precisely. It, it never happened, you and Mr. Hitchcock? No, no, it never did, because I wasn't cold enough. Yeah. He knew that if he opened me up, <laughs> those demons, I, I, would, I would destroy him. <laughs> he, he liked women to be cold and, and stingy. He liked sin stingy women. If he asked me something, I would have given him too much. Jean Moreau, thank you very much. Orson used to take me to have dinner with him. That's the first time I ate angulas, baby eels. Yeah. Oh, it's lovely. It's <laughs> boiled in oil with garlic and mm. everything. Oh, I was a dog. I love it. Thrust at your belly. The only person who knew where Orson was was a woman called Mrs. Rogers. And when really I missed Orson too much, I would call. I said, where is Orson? South America. Where is Orson? Austria. Where is Orson? Far East. It was always like that. <laughs>